afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Martha Stroud. I'm the Associate Director of the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this public lecture by our 2019-2020 Robert J. Katz Research Fellow in Genocide Studies at North Korkmaz. Uh, before we proceed with the, um, the happenings here, I would just want to extend a few thank yous to our partners at the USC Institute of Armenian Studies, Southie, who you'll hear from in a moment, and Silva, who uh, did a magnificent job of helping to organize the event, to Francesca from the USC Shoah Foundation, who impeccably contributed to the organization of this event, um, thank you so much. So this is our last public event of the fall semester. We already have several exciting lectures planned for the spring, so please sign up for our newsletter at the table in the back to be notified about all the upcoming lectures and events. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the director of the USC Institute of Armenian Studies, Salfi Hazari. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Wolf. Uh, thank you to the Center for Advanced Genocide Research show for always partnership. Um, introducing Aisha Noor is easy. She's from the University of Amsterdam. She's a PhD researcher. And she studies something that's really very interesting, something that um, many of us in the West forget is a part of genocide, post-genocide research. And that is that for decades, um, we have interviewed genocide survivors and spoken of genocide survivors, always speaking about the ones who made it to the Middle East and those who made it to the West. And very rarely speaking about those who made it to Armenia, and even more rarely speaking about those who survived and stayed in Turkey under a variety of, of circumstances. And circumstances changing. And so, what Aisha Nur has done is, is really look at these two different lesser known areas. The perception, the memories of genocide survivors from Armenia, Soviet Armenia, now the Republic of Armenia, and of course those living, continuing to live on their historical lands. So this is really very special. I know you're going to want to refer people to this talk. It is being recorded. It will live on the Center for Advanced Genocide Research website. It will live on the Institute of Armenian Studies YouTube. And um, on, I've also conducted a podcast with Aisha Nur, which exists on the Institute's podcast channel, and uh, which is everywhere, you know, all of the podcast places. So please do refer friends, colleagues to this subject and this researcher and this talk. Thank you, and Aisha Nur, welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Salty, for that heartwarming um, talk and invitation, uh, introduction. Um, before I start, I would like to thank um, the USC Shoah Foundation, uh, Robert, Robert J. Katz Center for providing this fellowship, this PhD fellowship. Um, I want to thank especially Martha, Wolf, of course, Badema at the center. Uh, I want to thank Manuka Avedikian. Um, and I want to thank uh, USC Armenian Studies for supporting my research in many different ways. It wouldn't be uh, easier without you. Thank you very much. My talk today will be in four parts, the first of which is my PhD project summary, and the second part. I will explain what were the things uh, in this project that I needed additionally and how I chose to research them at the Shoah Foundation particularly, but not only. Um, then I will talk a little bit about my methodology and how I found my findings. Um, and then uh, I will introduce the themes and those findings in two separate parts. Um, the parts are unrelated, 
Um, nevertheless, they inform certain sections of my PhD research. In the first part, I will talk about refugeedom in the South Caucasus during the time of the genocide and in the aftermath as well. And in the second part, I will talk about the conceptions of home among survivors. Now, let me briefly talk about my research. I focus on the articulations of homeland among the ex-Ottoman Armenians, uh, particularly those who ended up in the South Caucasus and lived in Soviet Georgia and Soviet Armenia in the aftermath of the genocide. This was not a small population. At a time where Soviet Armenia's population was half a million, ex-Ottoman Armenians amounted to 250,000 to 300,000 refugees. Yet, it has remained understudied um, it has remained under the shadow of those who ended up in the Middle East and hence in the diaspora. So what I do is that I look at how the survivors settled in the towns and villages located in the western part of Soviet Armenia and in Yerevan, a few kilometers from the borders of the newly founded Turkish state in 1923. The refugees waiting for the return to their hometowns in grief and despair, they prolonged the possibilities for creating a new future for themselves and making a new home out of the land of refuge, Soviet Armenia. They became mostly um, Soviet Armenian citizens or Soviet Georgian citizens. Um, but, of course, over time, they have established connections with this land of refuge. They ad adopted their dialect from Western Armenian to Eastern Armenian. They had to adjust their views economically and politically to the hugely transformed USSR, the Soviet Union. And also, they had to find new ways of creating homes for themselves, be it refugee camps or refugee settlements. So over time, they did achieve a sense of home. But up until today, we see that they have maintained a sense of loss and nostalgia for their vanished home that they named as Yergir. Yergir is a term in Armenian that has existed prior to the Armenian Genocide. It means the country in Armenian. And it denotes two separate physical spaces. One is the type of abstract political and national homeland. So it refers to the lost territories uh, of Western Armenia or historic Armenia or Wilsonian Armenia. Um, of course, in the conceptualizations of the refugees and politicians and ideologues. And it is perceived to be particularly lost due to the genocide. The second is rather like from the realistic experiential experience. And that is the local homeland. It denotes the certain localities, the certain places such as provinces, towns, villages located in Western Armenia or as I would like to call it Ottoman East because it's in the eastern part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, these localities have been referred before the genocide as Yergir. So if it was for Van, it would have been referred to as Vasburakani Yergir in intellectual uh, writings and uh, newspaper columns and other articles. 
if it was for Musho, Mush, it, it would be uh, named as Musho Yergir or Sasun Sasna Yergir, etc., etc. And in my historical and anthropological research, I explore the understanding of Yergir with the survivors themselves and their descendants. The question I address is, how did the Armenians turn their experiences of loss of home and loss of social networks into material and immaterial rituals? These communities engage in a set of ritualistic practices that sacralize and commemorate their land of origin, in quotation marks, in Anatolia, particularly in Eastern Anatolia today. They travel from Armenia to Turkey in acts of roots tourism or genocide tourism or dark tourism, where they visit ancestral towns the historical sites, churches, graves or relatives if they could find, or the ancestral home, again, if they could find, as well as other memory scapes. They treat these sites as pilgrimage sites and their journey a, a type of pilgrimage. On these sites, they collect memory scapes such as stones, um, water, a handful of soil, for which, for them, they signify the sacred fragments that must be restored to Armenians decades after being stolen and damaged and polluted by the act of the genocide. By doing so, they alter the temporalities and the historical nuances associated with these sites, bringing them into a timeless realm. Often, uh, when I go with the descendants of survivors, I see them recapturing, re-understanding their Yergir in the most remote places, such as mountains and rivers, never in neighborhoods where other people live. Other than these, rituals, they also transform their experiences of uprooting and disruption of kinship into aesthetic objects, such as the um, family tree you can see on the left. They are very much interested in archiving and commemorating their generational descent. To understand the extent to sacralization and the materialization of land and kinship, or genealogy, you might say. The experiences of the genocide survivors is crucial to make sense of. That was one of the areas, actually, I felt lost the most, because in the world that we live, the first generation survivors don't live anymore. So we're left with their children or grandchildren, and we are left with their memories that are transmitted to next generations. This was one of the reasons why I wanted to apply to uh, the Shoah Foundation. And having this fellowship made me realize in certain ways that there were other advantages that I never thought of. For instance, the comparison between survivors in Armenia as refugees in their own homeland and survivors in the diaspora. What type of survivor categories can we come up with if we were to compare Armenia to diaspora? I will come to that in the next um, slides. What I also found out was that from the Ottoman East, from the Eastern Anatolia that I described, certain communities, certain Armenian communities escaped to the South Caucasus. But there were other routes, if I may show you, over here to the South Caucasus to, towards Yerevan, you see movement 
green small movements. But there were other movements, deportation routes towards the Syrian desert, as well as towards the Aegean side, Istanbul and the Marmara side, or upwards in Black Sea. So I thought this was, again, a good comparison to see the survivors from all over the Ottoman Empire, but not only from the eastern part. And when I digged into the interviews, I also realized there is immense material on survivor experiences from Armenia as well. Particularly, uh, I'll come to this, but um, Havanesian oral history uh, uh, collection looks much more promising than Armenia uh, Film Foundation on that front. So, my talk today will be in four parts, as I said. I will introduce the methodology and how I have done things. And based on that, I'll go to the research questions, uh, explain how I see it, and then I will explain refugeehood in the South Caucasus, and then finally, conceptions of home. In the methodology, I'd like to highlight two things. One is that the collections that are available are very different from one another. So Armenian Film, Armenian Film Foundation um, has uh, 333 sur survivor testimonies. Uh, a large part of it I found very interesting. They're rather short, um, and they are particularly recorded uh, by Michael Hagopian, a documentary maker, for a documentary. So often uh, you'll find sound bites instead of a free-flowing interview. Whereas with the Hovhannisian oral history collect collection, there's much more space for researchers to understand um, much more structurally how um, life was, everyday life was before the violence, how was violence, and in the aftermath of the violence survivors thought, the reflection of it. And um, other point that I want to make is the keywords. So I found out that not every keyword is going to work to find certain videos. So what, what I realized is that there are similar ones. And if I combine them, then I get the best result. Instead of um, let the computer do the selecting, I wanted to do the selecting myself. The analysis I will give here is in two parts. It has two research questions. Um, one is rather historical. The other one is rather theoretical. The first question is, how did the survivors in the Caucasus understand the myriad ramifications of their flight, and how did they adapt? Of course, how did they adapt in Soviet Armenia? The second question is relating to conceptions of home. How do the Armenian genocide survivors relate to their place of origin and ex-social networks after the violence and the forced displacement? How do they remember their vanished home and lost families? Now, what we know about Armenian refugeehood in the, Caucas in the South Caucasus is actually pretty well established. There is good scholarship on the topic, um, thanks to which we know about the camp conditions, about the refugee settlements, about the rel relief, Western relief committees operating, um, 
and then uh, settlements conditions being overcrowded and hotbed of epidemics and famine. Um, we also know that refugees had agency uh, much more than previously taught because they initiated self-help committees and programs, uh, especially when relief committees uh, did not suffice. When I did the search on the database, I added all of these index terms that you could see, and I found 24 testimonies, 85 segments, that were relevant to survivors' experiences in the refugee hood in the Caucasus. What I found was that the scholarship was confirmed, more or less. Um, what I got confirmed was the casualties due to famine and epidemics in the camps and settlements. Several survivors talked about witnessing the death of their loved ones or child abon abandonment due to various types of diseases. Parents realize that they cannot look after their child, uh, otherwise they're gonna die as well, so they left them to the camps. Um, they also did not have food resources or means to look after themselves, and hence they established self-help committees or settlements. What I also found was that refugees en route to the South Caucasus joined Armenian paramilitary units, especially male ones, uh, Levon Ashtian and Harutun Sarkisyan uh, being examples. Before coming here to USC Shoah Foundation to do this research, I had a hunch about certain escape routes that refugees uh, were using. Because um, from the memoirs or the archival work, uh, it became clear that the battle zones between the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire closed certain routes. And so at those times, refugees would take different routes. So I had created this map before coming here for my, one of my chapters. And I also found out that this was the case. I found one of the interviews um, was Richard Ashton, among many. And Richard Ashton is from Vaughan. Uh, he was a child by the time uh, he and his mother had to leave. Um, this was during the, uh, right in the aftermath of the Vaughan Rebellion, for those who are familiar. And when the rebellion failed, uh, the Ottomans encroached and um, a lot of civilians had to leave, and Ashton was one of them. What happens is that they realize that the route that they were supposed to take is closed, and so they have to change. And I quote, the distance between Van and Yerevan is about 150 miles, but that route was being attacked constantly by the Turks, and our group that was leaving Van was told, if we will pass beyond the mountains and go on to the other side of the mountains, then there is no crossover to Yerevan. From there, you go to Tiflis and come south. So actually, instead of traveling 150 miles, we traveled between 225 or two, and 200 50 miles in order to get to Yerevan. The testimonies also shed light into an undiscovered fact, I want to say. Um, this was something I had already encountered in the accounts of the descendants about their parents and grandparents' flight stories. And 
they were telling me that um, refugees continued traversing South Caucasus after the violence. And they never explained the reason that clearly. Some people said uh, they were looking for a better home. Uh, others said they were looking uh, uh, for an option to return. And uh, some others said that they were looking for safety. Mobile security is much more important than anything for refugees at, at the time of crisis, of course. So this is a clip from uh, Khasoyan, Shogik Khasoyan. Uh, she is from Armenia. She is one of the refugees who ended up in Armenia. And um, she will speak with a strong accent for those who don't know Armenian or who won't understand her accent. I will uh, try to summarize um, what she's talking about. So what she's talking about is that she was in a refugee um, group that was headed by the uh, Armenian paramilitary battalions. And the battalions did not just leave them at the refugee camps and the settlements. When they continued to fight, refugees followed them. And they followed them to Goris, to Azerbaijani villages in the southern part of Armenia and even in Iran. And the reason for this, it seems to me, is finding food, to begin with, of course. Second, finding relevant, the type of similar settlement to the former home, and then the type of security that is not existent at camps and settlements. Because we know that the years 1917, 1918 was again a lot of skirmish, a lot of battle between the Turkish forces and the, um, the, the Armenian sources and the, the, the Russian. Uh, and not just in the Ottoman Anatolia, but also in the South Caucasus. So that's how I explain it. What I also found was, again, something that I got confirmed for uh, my research, was basically that genocide survivors got persecuted second time. And not all of them, of course, but there are certain personas, certain types of refugees that became much more at risk of being persecuted by the Stalinist um, purges. For those who don't know about the Stalinist purges, let me briefly explain. Uh, 1936, 37, 38, um, the Stalinist government uh, basically gathered every untrusted uh, USSR citizen from every SSR uh, and uh, either shot them, uh, imprisoned them, sent them to labor camps in Siberia or internal exile. And these were mostly politically motivated persecutions. Uh, and what we see in the Armenian case, in total, there are about 40, 45,000 Armenians who fell victim to the uh, Gulag uh, persecutions. And um, Aravni Asaturian and again Shorik Khasoyan's uh, brothers 
Aramni Asaturian's uncle, uh, Hasoyan's brother, uh, they end up uh, being sent to Siberia, one of them dies. Um, so that is, again, it's stretching, of course, 20s, 30s in uh, Soviet Armenia, but it was, uh, again, highlighted by the uh, testimonies. <coughs> now, let's move on to the second part of the talk, and that is survivors' home conceptions. How do we define home is a difficult question to answer. Social scientists would define it, explain it in different ways, um, humanities, uh, philosophers, what have you. But I'll give you my own definition. Scholars, of course, have studied this, and I rely this definition, I base this definition on the previous work that they have done. And to my understanding is, home is a partly imagined, partly invented, multiple, fragmented, contested, and, and yet politically delineated by ideologies and states as an entity. I use the word home instead of homeland for two reasons. One is it is an umbrella term that can denote homeland. Um, not always, of course. And second, it is not as politically charged. Because home can also denote the micro perspective, as I showed you in the concept of Yergir before. It can denote a, a rather abstract homeland, or it can mean your village. And of course, scholars have warned against essentialization of home, emphasizing that the displaced practices often transcend geographically fixed notions of home and spatial belonging. They argued that populations in the modern world are more mobile than ever. Apadurai, for instance, identified globalization, mobility, and deterritorialization of identities as the central features of our modern world. Similarly, Clifford underlined the necessity of moving beyond the myths of origin, the myths of home, shifting the scholarly focus from roots to routes. Such criticism is, of course, credible um, because it's on essentialist thinking of home and roots uh, and rootedness and identities. But on the other hand, I feel like overemphasizing the normalcy of human mobility may lead to a failure to acknowledge that there is continued importance of permanent homes for certain populations. And that is in the case of forced displacement. When populations undergo forced displacement and removal and relocation, I think home becomes much more relevant to discuss. So we have to put home into the context of uh, violence and forced migration to understand it. And that's exactly what I try to do. Now, what's the relevance of home? And especially what's the relevance of home in the context of the Armenian genocide? The Armenian case to me has a conceptual relevance and then a practical relevance. Um, as I have defined the concept of Yergir, um, it asks, it tries to understand how the Armenian genocide survivors relate to the pr places they have been displaced from in the aftermath of violence. How do they look back their own notions of home? It's not that they didn't have notions of home before being displaced. And how do they call those places? How do they describe them? And these questions are all relevant to help bridge the gaps between the study of the Armenian genocide and rather on the periphery studies of refugee studies, studies of diaspora studies. <coughs> the concept of home also teaches us about the social fabric of society that has forever been destroyed by the genocide. 
the everyday life, the routines, how are they unraveled? There's also a practical relevance, and that has to do with, in my opinion, restitution. Often discussions about compensation from the Turkish state or not revolves around the ideological thoughts of political parties and nation states, regarding homeland especially. Um, but the understanding of micro home, the home that you have lost and the home that you want back, is often unattended. The way that survivors conceptualize home can show how similar or different they think from those ideologues and politicians. And what do they want in terms of restitution? And there's one way to understand that. That is to come up with a typology of home. <coughs> Excuse me. Helen Taylor is a scholar of refugee studies who focuses on the refugees of the uh, 1970 war, 74 war and the forced population, forced displacement of both Turkish and Greek populations in Cyprus. And she has come up with this typology during her field work, based on her field work with uh, the refugee populations living in Britain. In each chapter, she engages with the discussions with a different, different analytical element, um, and those are four. One of them is spatial home, another one is material home, temporal home, and relational home. When I use this typology to explain the Armenian survivors, their own conceptions of home, I also found out that their idea of home is multiple. It encompasses the house, it encompasses the village, the region, or sometimes even the new house, the new home in the host country, be it diaspora or Armenia. I'll start with the first typology, that is spatial home. The idea of home as a space, as a physically or geographically delineated place, is perhaps the most common way of defining home. Spatial home could be village, a town, or an abstract space that is politically charged. In the interviews, I spotted a number of ways of defining the land, defining the home that Armenian survivors have been displaced from. Some just focused on their local home, others have embellished their narratives with imaginations of political homelands. And here are some, though, some of those definitions. The first one uh, is six survivors have used it. Uh, the concept I have explained, Yergir or Hin Yergiri, the old country or country. Um, 13 survivors, to my surprise, called the land Turkey, Tajikistan. Um, and 28 survivors called it Aramitian Hayastan, which is Western Armenia. Three survivors mentioned the land as historic Armenia or Wilsonian Armenia. And almost everyone, of course, referred to their home as the local, uh, the real, the relational home. Let's move on to material home. I define material home anything and everything that survivors had, including property, objects, anything with monetary value that had existed in their role before the violence and before the displacement. And to find relevant interviews, I tried the following um, keywords in combination with the database. They are family home, property seizure, uh, looting, and socioeconomic status. There were 73 interviews that I could make use of. Excuse me, my slides are some messed up. Um, so 
I thought, how could I bring these typologies into sections where I could, where we could learn about everyday life history of uh, the the refugees? First of all, we can learn about their socioeconomic status of. Uh, families and, and bigger extended families. And there I found that the ones, the interviews from diaspora had much more, much better socioeconomic status than those in Armenia. This is not something that should come as surprise because Soviet Armenia was the land that every Armenian refugee with money had to leave. They used it as a sort of ladder to move to other places. So that wasn't very surprising. Second is the condition of houses. Uh, again, the socioeconomic status comes in play here. Uh, houses in the east, uh, where lots of rural peasant population lives, uh, we see uh, that bigger family groups live in them collectively, whereas in urban places, uh, with richer families, uh, houses are much bigger. And they are mostly restored for one nuclear family. The understanding of family and kinship itself. So um, these are all constructed. One is uh, extended family that is named Gerdastan. Um, the other is nuclear family, Antanik. So when people talk about their home, they often refer to their family members as well, and how did they live in those uh, houses, in those material houses, was very much variable. Uh, the ones that, that were in the diaspora had much more comfortable life having the house for themselves, and the ones with rural backgrounds and rather poor backgrounds had uh, bigger families with 30, 35 family members in one household. And of course, that brings me to my final point of this slide. That is the economic, socioeconomic status that possibly weighs on the possibility of survival. What I found that most of the refugees who ended up uh, in the diaspora with money, with urban background, lost their material home, but survived. And there was actually one interview by Alice Shipley. I didn't put her here. It's uh, unfortunate. But she talks about how um, other rural Armenians were really jealous on the refugee route because no one from her family died. And others, uh, one by one, of course, lost family members. What I also found was that people tried to destroy their homes because they didn't want to hand them to the, uh, to the benefiters and the perpetrators. And these are often property. So it's not like burning your own house, although I have listened to one or two incidents like that as well, refugees leaving and then uh, lighting it on fire, um, or they think they, one of their family member did it. But one example is Lamiel Amerian. Um, this was an interview for Armenian Film Foundation, and there he describes the way from Van towards Iran, and how he saw families basically uh, setting their own property on fire. I quote, my father knew the countryside, the layout. He let us, perhaps 5,000 other refugees, the remnants of the Armenians in Van. He let us into Persia. On the road, just maybe more than a day away, I saw that people were throwing their rugs, their belongings, whatever they were carrying except bread or any type of nourishment they needed into this bonfire. What I also found was that people get very emotional about 
certain objects, certain properties that they had. One example is Richard Ashton, who's a survivor from Vaughan, and I had introduced him before. He's a child when the massacres had happened. He escaped with his mom, burying all the valuables at the backyard of the house. But there was one thing that he couldn't get, though wanting it. And that was apples. At the backyard, there was an apple tree where his father was a botanist. He was raising trees uh, for seeds, for new apple seeds. So his mother didn't let him taste those apples. Let's listen to it together. Well, let me tell you the story of leaving her uh, mother in this event. But when we decided to go, we had a giant apricot tree in, in our yard next to the house. Mm -hmm. Ten feet to the left, we buried clothing we couldn't take with us. Twenty feet to the right, we buried pots and pans we couldn't carry. Mm -hmm. And so on. So we did have these hopes of perhaps coming back. Coming back. And <coughs> Excuse me. My father was an amateur Luther Burbank. He used to cross food fruit. And that August, he had developed a new apple that looked like the California Golden Delicious. We didn't have an army yet. Wow. And as we were leaving, there were seven yellow apples on there. So I turned to my mother and I said, Mike, mm -hmm. can I taste one of those apples? Uh -huh. And she said, son, she said, you know, your father is developing that for the seeds. Mm -hmm. We should be back in three or four days, and when your father takes the seeds, you can taste the apple. Mm -hmm. To this day, I wonder which Turkish soldiers ate the apples my father had developed, and I couldn't even taste one. Mm -hmm. So the four days is over yet. We haven't done that to taste the apples. Mm -hmm. That's the story of that. There are actually 12 more interviews that I thought which one of them would be better here in this segment, but people are really eager to talk about the objects they lost, the properties they lost. Um, Shipley, uh, Alice Shipley, whom I talked before, is also a very good example. Um, she says basically she has lost, her family lost everything but one donkey. And when the Kurdish tribes um, had come on the refugee route, they were mounting attacks. Um, they basically did their best to defend that donkey. So these types of things are very important because moments of grasping that the material home is gone is exactly that moment. Let's talk about temporal home. It's a very useful concept, I find, because time is central to the meanings we create around home. Our experience of home is marked by human cycle, life cycle, the births and deaths and annual events and seasons and religious festivals, harvests, what have you. And all of these temporalities shape our experience of home, our understanding of home. In almost all of the interviews within the Hovhanesian oral history uh, collection, survivors temporalize their home through events of childhood mostly because they're asked about those. So in um, almost all of them, I found very good exemplary accounts that I thought I can use for my thesis. Unfortunately, another observation was that Armenian Film Foundation was not very sufficient on that front because it focuses, the accounts focus on the violence itself. Um, so if interviewers won't ask those questions about childhood, the temporalization of home does not really exist. It's not, not that it's there, but not, it's not that it's not there, but uh, basically if you don't ask, you don't get. What I found um, also interesting was the concept of return. It's not very much uttered. Um, in few interviews, I, I spotted in, uh, survivors talking about 
whether they could return, whether they would want to return. And that also made me realize this is related to temporal home because often people want that exact setting before the violence to be able to return. Keram Gevorkian um, is from Arhund, the village of Arhund in Mush. And the interviewer asks him whether he would go back to live in Mush or in Istanbul, where he also spent time. And he, he responds, where can I go? Who is there? If the Turkish state had recognized what it had done, I would gladly go back. If they would give our lands back, I would go. Otherwise, there's no one I know. That is one. It will be a Kurdish environment. That is two. And I don't know their language anymore. And that is three. So it doesn't make any sense. And finally, relational home. Of course, home is very much about social relationships and networks. In most of the interviews, survivors have reflected on their loved ones and lost networks and family members when they were asked about home. So not particularly when, when they want to know, the interviewers want to know who the family members were, but how was your home? How would you describe home as a question that is often direct, directed towards understanding how was your home spatially? But survivors responded in familial terms and genealogical terms. And that I thought was very telling. In this particular interview, you will also spot um, a confluence between material home and relational home. So she brings her house, her socioeconomic status, next to relatives and everything. And all that makes her home that she lost. Her name is Cheronik uh, Shehirian. And um, let's listen. <laughs> So for those who want to understand, she's talking about um, that they were rich and they had everything. Their house was really beautiful, big. Uh, she had 13 family members in her house. And um, she simply says, we all have been lost. We all have died. There's only one or two family members with me now. Um, and so she basically merges uh, the two, uh, the familial uh, networks, the social networks with the actual material home she lived in. Uh, that brings me to my conclusion. In this talk, I tried to do two separate things. One, that I tried to make sense of survivors' experiences with refugeehood in the South Caucasus uh, during the time of the genocide and in the aftermath of the genocide. Second, I attempted to employ a theoretical understanding of home based on the testimonies of the Armenian genocide survivors. And I argued that home is not only an abstract political entity, but also 
spatially, locally anchored. It can be a material home where one's experiences happen. It can be one's garden, room, street, neighborhood, farm field, where all the daily life local traditions and the rich tapestry of social relations and conflicts unfold. Home can contain the loved ones, neighbors, childhood lovers, family members, relatives, in the way that it has been so lost, in the way that it has been unraveled. It means the loss of home. So I want to briefly reflect on what I have learned and, and how VHA adjusted uh, my views and what do I want to do in the future. Um, I am very happy that the testimonies got a lot of things confirmed for me. Um, I got to compare the diaspora Armenians to uh, Armenians in Armenia. I had a lot of observations regarding the lines of socioeconomic status. Um, there were a few discoveries. Uh, among them was the traversing refugees and why would they continue with battalions instead of staying in one place. And the further directions I want to take uh, are mostly regarding the uh, Richard Havanesian oral history uh, archives because they are just being indexed and just being put online. Um, and I'm really looking forward to having um, better opportunities for articles and new projects to work with them. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, so now we'll have a Q&A period, a discussion period. So Go ahead, but please come forward so that people can hear you. First of all, and secondly, I wanted to know if in your research and in your, uh, you know, looking into the traversing with the, the paramilitary battalions post-violence, you spoke of Zankezur, Southern Armenia, after the fall of mountainous Armenia, which was Zankezur in 1921, um, it's little known, but it is chronicled in certain areas that from that time until about the mid-20s, there was still cross-border uh, operations, if you will, not just by Armenians, but by others, uh, into Zankezur, into Harapal, against the Bolsheviks. I wondered if, if any of your research took you, did you hear of any of this? I have only heard about uh, one of the rebellions that took place in, in Turkey, in Ada, where Ara Mountain is. Um, and there, uh, I have read a paper about um, Armenian refugees from Armenia crossing the border and helping the rebellion, uh, the Kurdish rebellion against the Turkish state. So it is, it is possible that um, the border was not very much controlled, not very much controlled. Uh, but I haven't come across anything in the testimonies or I haven't come across anything in the archival work. I think it may be interesting for you because uh, it's uh, in the geographic area you're interested in and the time frame. Yeah. And it's a little known thing. Yeah. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Manu, go ahead. You deserve this. <laughs> um, throughout <coughs> however many interviews that you watched, what major differences have you seen between ideas of home among many of these diaspora Armenian survivors and the, at least the, 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 those, of the, those in Armenia? Yeah. Uh, what major um, differences, or if there are any? Yes, there are. The, the way they talk about the spatial home was different. Um, so they only said Yergir or Ergir. Uh, they never said Adam Mutian Hayastan. Only new generations now Which call they? Uh, in Armenia. Armenians in Armenia. Um, and they also use words uh, like Tajkastan, uh, Armenians in Armenia. 
And I'm assuming because it's Soviet Armenia by the time that these are recorded, um, and Western Armenia was very much uh, prominent in, among the diaspora Armenians as a term. Uh, and in terms of others, I can't really think of any. Go ahead, Anna. <laughs> Do you see any convergence in the idea of home between those in the diaspora and any of the hidden Armenians in Turkey today? That is a uh, part of my actually previous research, uh, Armenians in Turkey or uh, Islamized Armenians. Um, it's different because they're still on the land um, and they often are accused by diasporans and Armenians from Armenia for not suffering enough because they have been on the land. Uh, on the other hand, um, I wonder whether they are more or less the same way uprooted um, because having home, having spatial, physical experience with the place that your ancestors were living does not simply mean that it's the same place. You become uh, a much more fearful minority. So um, there are reactions to one another, but I won't really understand uh, the base of such reactions to one another, whether uh, it will be better if you are living on the land or not living on the land. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to pick up on Manuk's question because uh, I had a similar one. I was also struck that you mentioned that uh, the 10 uh, kind of testimonies talked about Turkey. So maybe can you be a little bit more precise in uh, where the differences, kind of where is this coming from? Uh, Sorry. Different, uh, is there a difference in, uh, from which collection the, uh, the, the testimony is? Is there a uh, difference uh, in the origin of these survivors, where they or uh, originally are from? Uh, you responded and said uh, mostly from Soviet Armenia. But is there also a kind of uh, something about the time when they are interviewed? They're interviewed in the 80s. Uh, so between 83 and 87, if I should be precise. Um, and it's interesting because, I mean, they're actually very old uh, in, in terms of their, they were old kids when they were uh, persecuted during the time of the genocide. Uh, they all ended up in orphanages. Some in Armenia have ended up believing in Bolshevik um, ideology, uh, the, the fact that they should not be as uh, nationalistic, etc. despite losing their home. So it could be from there. Um, and most of the survivors are actually from particular parts of the Ottoman Empire in Armenia. So they are from uh, the eastern borderlands of the Ottoman Empire. Otherwise, there, there wouldn't be any other option to go to the South Caucasus. They just left with the Russian army and the Armenian paramilitary battalions to the South Caucasus. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. You're possibly the first who's had the opportunity to deal with both collections. And so, so that comparison was very interesting. Um, you're talking about interviews that you have not done. These are interviews from the, the VHA. Yet you yourself have interviewed uh, both in Turkey and in Armenia. You're a Turkish woman. You're a hijabi woman. Has that informed in any way the conversation of the responses? Do you see anything in these responses that perhaps might have been different if it were you? Mm. Of course, yeah. Uh, interviewer really changes the narrative. Uh, I mean, often people talk to me, when I interview with the descendants, they talk to me about religion because uh, they feel like they have to address that issue because I have such a symbol on my head. Uh, or um, I think another point would be uh, simply my ethnicity, my perceived ethnicity. I am partly from Iraq, partly from Turkey, but uh, I can never get my respondents understand that I am partly from Turkey. 
Um, so they always uh, perceive me as a Turkish, a, a Turkish woman or the type of hidden, hidden Armenian who was born in Turkey and, and she ha doesn't have the guts to say that she has ancestry. Um, so definitely, definitely it would um, make a lot of difference uh, if I was the one in the oral history Armenian the film foundation or the Hovhannisian oral history collection. Go ahead, Shisha. Um You talked about uh, the descendants who ended up in the South Caucasus transitioning from Western Armenian to Eastern Armenian. Was there any kind of convergence of lost language as lost home, kind of the language as a symbolic home, yeah. um, as another thread of the kind of articulations of home? Definitely. And you see that in the refugees' childhood memoirs and also novels, the short novels and short stories that they write. Um, they often use the dialect. Um, that they come from. If they are coming from Mush, they'll use Mush dialect. If they come from Van, they'll use Van dialect. Um, and of course, let's not forget the communities who have moved to uh, Armenia, to Soviet Armenia, they did learn Eastern Armenian, but up to today, they actually kept their accent, they, their, their own way of speaking from that very locality, let's say, they are from Vaughan. They'll speak like Vanetsi Armenians. So uh, that hasn't been lost. It has been preserved among families, especially in rural parts. Wolf again. Sorry, but uh, this was very interesting to me uh, about language and uh, because this kind of relocation, forced relocation, kind of cuts you from the language from the territory, which is kind of connected to. So when you just mentioned the accent that they have practically this dialect, does this also include that they still, after so many years, use certain terms which derive from your or kind of uh, 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 location of origin, which have no connection to where they live now? Absolutely. So there are so many Turkish and Kurdish words in uh, the dialect, the type of dialect Armenian. And even Eastern Armenian actually has been imbued with those words. So they will have the Russian word, or they'll have the, the Armenian world from like old Armenian, but in Armenia they prefer to use those words. Um, it's a part of the social linguistic fabric. Go ahead, Fadi. I'm curious, this might sound a bit strange, but it's kind of inspired by my own research. Have you ever encountered well-off descendants living in diaspora, buying back properties lost yes. during genocide? They, I actually met two uh, who sued the Turkish government for their material home. So it, it actually has this, the type of typology, the type of theme, like material home, is very much <coughs> visible. You know, the, the Turkish state uh, started uh, giving uh, certain uh, buildings, church buildings and monastery buildings, to the uh, Armenian uh, patriarchy, for instance. Um, and this comes without the, uh, the recognition or anything, but it certainly is there. So the materi material home is something separate from that um, national or political home that they perceive as Armenia or Western Armenia. And the Turkish state also has uh, that understanding, you know, people's local experience uh, with uh, persecution versus the whole uh, nation's persecution. Martha. Okay, let's talk about the apples. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a wonderful excerpt. Yeah. And you used it to um, talk about the material home, but I, I think that it's equally about the relational home mm -hmm. and the temporal home. Because he says we're still in these four days. We're still waiting to go home. And he's talking about his mother and asking her, you know, um, can I take these, you know, these, your father's making these. Mm -hmm. So even an example that you're using to kind of show, like, here you can locate material from this typology in this, um, in this excerpt, you actually see 
the spatial, the temporal, the relational, in addition to the material. Yes. Which makes me wonder, I, I think it's very clever how you've located these things from the typology in the stories that you listen to. Did you hear any echoes or s reverberations of things that don't fall into this typology? You don't have to define them right now because you're still in the midst of listening to these stories. But I wonder how apply applying the typology, it, it shows you something, but it might also obscure something else. Yeah. So, what so it, it leaves a lot of things out, I think. Uh, it, it leaves the violence out. Um, the fact that, uh, like the structure of violence, uh, which is very important. Uh, how certain communities perpetrated certain violence against uh, the, the communities. Uh, so it could be like sexual violence is not here, basically. Uh, we don't see the gendered uh, aspects of it, the, the differences and everything uh, is not there. Um, that's why I actually was a little bit more skeptical at the beginning when I read about these typologies, but I think for an article or even for a book that focuses on um, in the realm of diaspora studies and refugee studies, it's a good typology because it takes us away from that nationalism studies concepts. Everything and everything has to be about Turkey or Armenia. Um, and I simply, or everything, my own personal experience, the survivors' personal experiences, had to be attached to that political homeland. Um, and I show here that it can be actually detached as well. Um, when you look at it from very micro testimony perspective, you get into it and you, the whole picture gets blurred. But yeah, basically, it leaves certain things out. Go ahead, I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, so I know the last thing you want to do right now is think beyond your project, because you have to get it done. But I'm wondering if, if you think your methodology could be applied to cases of other diasporas. Um, and what, whether you think there's a cultural specificity to the results you're seeing, or whether it would be spread across different uh, diasporic groups? It would definitely be uh, beyond the Armenian genocide case. Um, I mean, in refugee studies, there's really a lot of discussion about this. Uh, and it's not of it, not all of it is genocidal cases either. There are cases of ethnic cleansings or forced uh, pop uh, population exchange between uh, Greece and Turkey, for instance, from the Middle East. Uh, India and Pakistan and 48 are really, really good examples. And there are works that have been done along the same uh, theoretical lines. Please. Go ahead. Um, in the late 1900s, when the Armenian Middle East relocated to Soviet Armenia, I'm just curious if you ran into any stories about either family reunifications or community bonds or anything like that that was formed. So with this particular one, you were talking about the 1946-49 um, uh, repatriation campaign. Actually, among us, there is one, Anna. Uh, you can talk to her uh, later on. Anna, too, the one who asked the question. <laughs> oh, you too? OK. Um, so in the testimonies, I haven't really um, looked into it. Uh, it's beyond. Uh, my project, uh, but I have read scholars write about these things, um, and also in the field in Armenia, I also come across um, that communities were really so strong in Soviet Armenia from 20s up to 40s. There were small villages that were established by refugees themselves. So they were named after the previous towns. Like if it was Arapkir, it would be Nor Arapkir, like the new Arapkir. Or uh, if it was Malatya, it would be Nor, Nor Malatya. And in those uh, neighborhoods, uh, repatriates, when they went back, they actually wanted to relocate with those. Uh, but that wasn't really possible. But 
um, in one of the cases uh, in Arabkir, actually, in Nor Arabkir, uh, there was an Armenian from Van who ended up in uh, the United States and then uh, responded to the repatriation call. And she actually found, randomly found her relatives because she thought they would be dead and she had no idea what had done to them. And often correspondence between official correspondence is not very uh, usable for ordinary people. So they wouldn't know it. She just randomly found her relatives in Arabia. It is possible. And there's also something else I have left out. I actually should have put it in the, um, uh, it. sorry, the relational home. Um, there are index terms um, about reunions of loved ones. Um, there were like five, six that were really relevant, uh, but it was not like this trans-border reunion. We do have a lot of those survivors that reunite with their Islamified like brothers or sisters, like sisters and they're like, it all films. But I know that's slightly outside the scope of your research. Yes. But there's some incredible, incredible cases. That's all? Go ahead. Uh, thank you for your flawless presentation and a delicious lunch. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, wow, you uh, I'm yes, a I've learned your Korean. Sis <laughs> uh, the Cal State uh, University Northridge just announced that uh, an anonymous donor donated uh, $2.1 million for Armenian studies uh -huh. in the, at the university. And uh, it was a big news for the uh, in the gallery. And then one of the city councilmen, 12 city councilmen of Los Angeles is uh, Armenian. He's doing okay. great job. You know? so That's great. I think it's a grassroots movement is going on. So I hope U.S. Congress will recognize uh, Armenian genocide legally and officially. What do you say? <laughs> well, to be honest, as a as a scholar, I know that um, political recognition doesn't really mean anything. Um, maybe it means it heals the community, but it was if it was done at the time, yes. But if it is for the purpose of hurting the other state because the other state had hurt you, I don't think it's simply about the Armenian genocide, but it's about something else. So I am very skeptical about political uh, state recognitions. Um, not because they open new avenues for researchers, for uh, populations to understand and be informed. Of course they would be. But at the same time, um, the motivation of it really disturbs me. Yeah. Anything else? That's it, I guess. It has been a long ride. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>